Hmm. All right. Why don't we go ahead and kick it off for now? Um, so to everyone in the group here, I um, apologize. Our our regularly scheduled speaker was was not available this week, so I'll be your substitute. So if you have any questions, as always, feel free to jump in uh, or reach out in the chat. Uh, Julius or Jared, if one of you don't mind just kind of monitoring the chat because I can't see it as well. Um, and just let me know. We can talk through all this nice and slow. We're going to focus on AAI device, just a specific case study that I thought was kind of interesting that you all might enjoy. Uh, we'll go over a little bit on anodal um, stimulation and the uh, the issues with that. And then finally, we'll just finish on the quiz. So shouldn't be too late today, but um, I'm always happy to answer questions and pause and talk through it. So just let me know. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> All right, perfect. So I'm not sure if you all can see the screen. Can you confirm for me, Julius? Yep. Yep. Good. Okay. Awesome. Um, so I'm not sure if you all know that much about anodal or sorry about AI devices. You probably won't see a lot of them. I'm going to turn off closed captioning. We'll add it later. Um, you probably will not see a lot of these. But if you remember, we had spoken previously about how AI works um, being in the atrial channel only. Um, it is pacing and sensing the atrial channel, um, and then it only reacts by inhibiting the, the pacing or in, if it senses intrinsic activity. So we don't really know what's going on in the ventricles at all. This is usually for patients with uh, you know sinus node dysfunction, but good conduction. If you have a conduction issue, you don't want an AI device. It's, we'll have no idea what's going on, and we could be pacing all day in the atrium, and the patient could be um, in complete asystole. So... Uh, we want to make sure that we're getting appropriate, you know, pacing solutions for patients. And you're probably not going to see a lot of this because you do, usually if you have an issue with your heart, it, 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 electrical system, it can progress. And if we have any kind of AV nodal dysfunction, you're going to want to have, you know, backup pacing in the ventricle. But here's an interesting case I came across. So we'll talk through it. All right. So. The patient presented themselves uh, in the hospital with uh, syncope. They were a bit of a psych patient, so we can't really confirm exactly what their situation was, but they said they had some lightheadedness and syncope, so they asked me to come by and take a look at this device. So <clears throat> if you look here, I went ahead and ran an atrial capture test, and you can see here my atrial pace on the far field unipolar channel an atrial pace on the SENSAMP channel, which is a bipolar unfiltered channel. You see this little event occur right here um, that seems to be directly associated with my atrial paces. So my first inclination is this is probably the patient's ventricular signal since we can see it on the far field, right? The far field is going from the, um, from the atrium all the way up to the can. So you have a decent uh, antenna there to pick up any kind of activity across the heart. This is probably some sort of intrinsic conduction, but you can never trust this. In an AI device, sometimes you may never see what's actually happening in the ventricle. We just happen to be able to with a far field channel on. One thing to note though, you have an atrial pace. It seems to actually capture and it conducts to the ventricle. So we assume we're capturing because of this one-to-one -one event here. All of a sudden, as we decrement down, we have an atrial pace and there's no associated ventricular activity or no associated event that is probably occurring in the ventricle. Um, but morphologically, it looks very similar to the pacing spike. So in this case, one thing to note is that, you know, you can have an identical um, pacing spike artifact and an evoked response. So don't always trust that you're capturing. In the atrium, not as much of a big deal. This is an atrially dependent patient, so it is a little more pivotal here, but say this is a ventricular patient, you can still have the same issue where a ventricular capture looks very similar to a ventricular pacing artifact, and you may think you're capturing when the patient is very much in asystole. Another reason why you should always have a surface, obviously I don't have a surface here because um, I, there's not always, you know, it, we don't always attach services to patients in the hospital when we interrogate them, especially if you have access to telemetry. Uh, so the only indication here ver of the capture is those far field R waves or what we assume to be far field R waves. Threshold here, you see we pace, ventricular event, pace, ventricular event. Here we pace, no ventricular event. So that is our loss of capture. I denote it here which means our threshold is 1.75 at 0 0.6. 
All right. So obviously 1.75 is not a great threshold. Uh, so we're going to see what else we can do. So what I try to do here is extend the pulse width out to see whether or not extending the time that I give a given amplitude um, will have an effect on capture. So I don't know if you remember many weeks back, we kind of drew out that strength and duration curve. And there is a um, there is an influence on how long you give energy and the amplitude of the energy or the, the amount of volts that uh, will influence what a capture threshold is. At a certain point, it doesn't matter how long you give a pulse for, if it's not a high enough amplitude, you will not capture, but there's definitely some room to work in there. So we extended out our pulse width to 0.8, ran capture threshold again. We seem to be conducting through, conducting through, pace, and then we lost. Now, one thing to note is this pace was at 1.25 volts and did seem to capture, this one did not. You can have, if you're right at threshold, some cat, some outputs will capture and some will not. So um, that's why sometimes it's good to actually extend the amount of paces um, that you do before you decrement down. If you have doubt about whether or not you're capturing, just because you could be capturing, you could be fusing. Um, but in this case, we pace, there's no evoked response. So we'll call that loss of capture here, which means the threshold is 1.5 at 0.8. All right. We ran it again, this time at one millisecond, same thing. We pace capture or pace conduct down. We pace no conduction indicating we lost capture. Um, so our threshold is 1.5 at one, still pretty much the same. Moving along here. So uh, just for fun, because I was going to be sending these to a physician and they wanted to be able to see exactly, you know, were we capturing? I went ahead and hooked them up to a surface electrode, which is recommended to do most of the time anyway. Um, and you can see here that these um, artifacts or these, uh, these electrical activity on the atrial channel is directly associated with what I have on the EKG. So this is a true ventricular event. So when we pace, you see the P wave, here, the evoked response from the P wave, you see the conduction here to a true ventricular event, and then you see that associated with the uh, with the event on the um, far field channel in the atrium. Okay, so we just confirmed that we were conducting, and when you lose conduction, yes, it could be pacemaker winky bach, but in this case, we're pacing nice and slow. We have consistent conduction, and then when we decrement down enough, we lose capture. That's a strong indication you're no longer capturing in the atrium. Okay, so what I want to do now is say, okay, if I went ahead and set <clears throat> a two to one threshold at 1.75, um, so our threshold was uh, of loss of capture was at 1.5 at 0.6, threshold 1.75 at 0.6. So if I want a two to one, we're getting above the voltage doubler in an Abbott device at 3.5 at 0.6 or around that, it was like 3.2 um, at 0.6 which is not exactly great for the battery, but you can go ahead and prove that by programming the outputs permanently, then actually going to the battery, um, the battery screen under test results. And here you can see the current drain. So the current drain for uh, the output is 12 micro ampere hours. Sorry, um, is the current drain, uh, shows your battery capacity. And I kind of, I just realized I kind of have these reversed right here. They should be the opposite. Um, I then went ahead and programmed the device at 1.1 milliseconds with an output of 2.5 um, because my old threshold was 1.25 at 1.1 milliseconds. So I gave my two to one threshold here and I checked my current drain. And in this case, it was 12 microampere hours. This one is cross associated with 15 um, microamps. So what I'm trying to say here is basically you have a voltage doubler in an Abbott device that's 2.5 volts. Anything you can do to stay at 2.5 or below will have a massive impact on the battery's longevity. So if we see here, by simply extending out the pulse width and setting the output at the 2.5 volt voltage doubler, you're getting five to six years on the battery's longevity versus by going for the shorter pulse width higher amplitude above the voltage doubler um, at 3.5 at 0.6, we're seeing four years, four to five years on the battery. So we're getting an extra year of longevity for this patient 
in cases where we have limited access to devices or not ideal follow-up, it's always better to squeeze whatever you can out of these batteries while maintaining a good uh, safety margin. So when in doubt, please reach out to us. You know, we're here to help and kind of advise you, but uh, always check your battery current drain. And I believe, I mean, Julius and Jared, feel free to chime in, but I believe most devices will show you your current drain um, as well as give you a longevity estimate. I don't know if either you know with Medtronic or Boston? Yeah, Medtronic gives a current drain, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it does. Perfect. So if you make any programming changes, um, one, consult a device expert and they can give you advice on how to extend the battery. Two, you can just check it yourself by looking at the battery current drain and saying, you know, how is this impacting it? Um, obviously, it makes a big difference over time if you can optimize the battery. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. And then one thing I wanted to point out here is always check um, lead values. So um, when you're going to do a threshold test, the last threshold test was back in October. Um, allegedly, I don't actually know. I wasn't there for it. They got one volt at 0.6. Uh, today, we got 1.25 volts at 1.1 milliseconds. Had I had the output at 2.5 at 0.6, we could very well have capture issues down the road. We could have had capture issues um, to begin with, and that could be related to her syncope. I don't have all that information, unfortunately, but this is why we always want to make sure to have a two to one margin. And also when you're going to test the threshold, be very attentive with dependent patients. Just because it said this threshold was one volt at 0.6, had I started at one volt at 0.6 or 1.2 volts at 0.6, I would have lost capture very quickly. And this patient may have been without any kind of uh, pacing for a period of time as I canceled the test. So don't always trust previous values. They're a good guide, but in general, always be attentive to, um, to an idea that if you have a dependent patient, be ready to come off that pacing threshold test as soon as possible um, if you don't think you're capturing. So another thing that kind of presented with this patient, they had hundreds, um, in this case, 42, but they've been overwritten, but for many, many years, they've had issues with false ATAF episodes, and this was resulting in them basically being ignored, right? So if you get a thousand ATAF episodes, no one's actually going to look at them at, at subsequent follow-ups because it's a known issue. You can kind of resolve this issue by programming it properly to begin with. That way you don't have this kind of alert blindness that can occur from having a false episode occur too many times. This patient could be having AFib, and it might be being ignored because we just assume it's fake. So in this case here, you see an atrial pace, and then you see an atrial sense that happens to look exactly like the atrial senses we saw previously on the near field sense amp channel here. Obviously the gain is different, but you see your atrial pace, and then you see a vent that could be sensed in the atrium. In this case, the amplitude is not enough to be detected, but in, in these episodes it is. So as a result, the device is counting each one of these towards, um, towards mode switch. When enough of these occur within a, a certain period of time, it will then go ahead and mode switch the device, which will, um, obviously it's not ideal. And then it will also, uh, well, it doesn't mode switch, sorry, because it's in a dual chamber, it will mode switch. Um, but obviously this is not ideal for uh, record keeping because we'll just assume this is AFib. So in this case, we see our A pace, 270 milliseconds later, we see an A sense, 293 milliseconds later, we see an A sense. The difference is it's just probably catching it at a different amplitude. That's why you see a slight difference in the, um, the timing. It could also be just conduction uh, timing differences as well. So what do we do about it? Well, in that case, we will go ahead and bump out our atrial refractory period. So um, this right here, under the parameter screen. And I can, if you ever have a question about it, just reach out and we can talk you through how to find it. But we went ahead and increased our shortest atrial refractory to 300 milliseconds and then our standard a pace refractory. So post pacing refractory or the time that it actually blinds the atrium to any kind of activity to 310 milliseconds. So you see here, our atrial re refractory is ending just a little prematurely the oversensed ventricular event occurs outside of the atrial refractory and it's counted. By extending the atrial refractory just to 310 milliseconds, it will ideally cover up this ventricular event. Um, one problem with AI devices is that this can occur. And you can make 
programming changes, but since we don't know there's anything happening in the ventricle, you are kind of, your hands are tied in some aspects of when the device should blind itself because it doesn't know what's occurring. So you can increase the sensitivity on the atrial channel, making it less sensitive. So increase the sensitivity value. If it's at 0.5, you can make it at one, um, but you run the risk of undersensing atrial events. Same thing, atrial refractory. You can extend this atrial refractory out, but as this patient, if their um, conduction degrades further over time, you'll still end up missing these events as they occur later and later. And you can either continue to blind the device, um, which is not advised because you're not going to be seeing the atrial events, or you can make the device less sensitive. But um, one thing to keep in mind about AI devices is they're, they only know what they know. And since they don't know what's happening in the ventricle, it can be problematic. So here's the final wrap up. The only changes I really made was extending the pulse width out. I left the output at 2.5 volts. That gives us a two to one safety margin. So 2.5 volts at 1.1 milliseconds will be my output. Um, atrial pace refractory was extended to 310 milliseconds. Shortest atrial refractory was 300 milliseconds. Shortest um, AREF is based upon patient's intrinsic activity. Um, or say it's like AAIR. So it will shorten it based upon um, that activity. So we wanna make sure it never gets shorter than the current um, conduction period. So 300 milliseconds. As this becomes more profound, we can make the device less sensitive if they have AV delay, um, AV degradation um, or a longer delay between the atrial pace and the ventricular activity. Um, obviously this patient had, when I checked them, it was a pacing at 30 beats a minute with a ventricular one-to-one -one conduction. So they didn't have a ventricular escape above 30 and they didn't have an atrial, um, any kind of atrial backup or junctional backup as well. So making the device less sensitive in the atrium is less of an issue. We'd rather the device pace more um, over pace rather than under pace in these cases. So any questions at all from the group on this? Nothing's been posted, AJ. Nothing's been that on the chat group so okay anything to add julius jared elvis we talked about this one a little bit i don't know if you have anything on it is your preference always to change the um the refractory periods over sensitivity i mean i noticed there that the sensitivity is quite low so you probably didn't have much wriggle room to uh to change that so i assume the refractory period is always going to be your best option in that case yeah. So the, the one thing too, to point out, I don't know, I, I wasn't able to get a sensed event. This okay. could have been the amplitude of the far field R. Gotcha. Um, if it yeah, got yeah. any longer in this patient, I don't think I'd go any more blanking, to be sure. honest. I would probably just raise, and there's still an argument can be made in a dependent patient with a, with a bad atrium, just make it very insensitive yeah. and just say just pace all yeah. the time. Pace all the time. Treat it like an AOA yeah. type of Exactly. So yeah. that if we start to see this down the road, that would be my recommendation. Yeah. But yeah, good point. No, you're fine Anything? with me, Jared. That's fine. You've covered everything. Okay. Sorry, AJ. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, no worries. Okay. I, I got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, I got the, the, uh, capture automatic the automatic capture uh, you didn't turn it up to automatic you left it at your program the threshold mm -hmm. i don't know if you get my question like right? since this um guys uh, this patient's uh threshold is not very reliable and the device depends on that to keep up the the uh, patient uh, i noticed you did not on on the automatic um, future so mm -hmm. that perhaps it continues to pace accordingly depending on the as the threshold control or is it that the patient will coming up to same to same on the short um distance basis no yeah so that that's a really good question so in this case here um i was having trouble with uh the atrial auto capture. And I, I think I forgot to mention that too when we chatted. Um, I was having trouble getting the atrial auto um, ACAP confirm algorithm to run. It doesn't always work if it can't determine um, evoked response versus um, 
versus non evoked response. Um, so in this case, I just couldn't get it on. I, there's definitely a, there's definitely an argument to be made for it, especially in the ventricle where you have good, um, where you have beat by beat follow-up with ACAP confirm. It's not beat by beat. It's, um, it retests itself on a clock. So we wouldn't necessarily have that same confirmation. So it's better for trends and you do get a little bit better, um, you know, capture assurance, but it's, it's not quite like ventricular auto capture where it's beat by beat. But it's, it's a good point. It, if it would work, I would probably yet say, yeah, turn it on because now we'll get like a lead trend. We'll get follow-up and you'll, with remote monitoring, you'll get a red flag of, Hey, we're not capturing. Sorry, AJ, it's Jared, mate. Uh, can you just, for my small brain, can you just confirm that again? So cap confirm in the V or is it auto capture that's beat to beat? I always get confused which one's which. So cap confirm um, is the similar, it's a very similar algorithm that uses like the Kendall Tau. I don't know, it, we can go through it at some point, but it's, I'd rather get an expert to go through it just because I studied it many years ago. But basically it's looking at, at what non-capture looks like versus capture to simplify it. Um, but it's not beat by beat in the same way that the RV auto capture works. So RV auto capture works is beat by beat. If it feels like okay. it's not capturing, it kicks, it does a five volt backup pace yeah. to ensure that it captures with a cap confirm. And then also with RV and LV cap confirm in by yep. V devices, those are not beat by beat. They run on a cycle. Okay. And that's why, that's why you see a margin of like one volt or more above the threshold versus mm -hmm. a cap confirm just does a 0.25 volt above output, knowing that you have a backup pace if things go bad. Gotcha. Gotcha, man. So RV8 cap confirm is the only beat to beat. Uh, is that, yeah, RV yeah, auto capture. Yeah, RV sorry, if it's, RV auto capture is the only beat to beat. Everything else is cap confirm. Correct. Which is on it. Cool. I'll remember that. Thanks, mate. Right. Yeah, welcome. And then if you set a by V device RV only, it will have RV auto capture as an ability. Okay. Thank you. Right. So, uh, uh, hi, Adrian. Yes, sir. Uh, one more, uh, two more questions actually. Uh, so is there an option for uh, rate modulation in this patient, in this device? Mm -hmm. Would this patient uh, become uh, uh, chronotropic incompetence? Mm -hmm. Would that be, is, there, is that option, does that option exist for this device? I, I've not seen an AI before, so... Yeah, no, that, that's that's absolutely right. And yes, it is it is very much available. Um, this patient was checked on the floor and it was more just because they wanted to see what the device was going on. Um, and without having, you know, uh, we try not to make too many drastic changes on the floor without having a physician, you know, present or at least to approve uh, anything. I mean, obviously they said these changes are fine, but as far as optimizing a sensor, you know, we'd want to sit down with a physician in the office to do that. Um, it's generally not something that we would just flip on on the floor in the U.S. Um, as a as a rep. However, you know, in in your setting, I'd say it's totally acceptable. In my opinion, this patient would benefit very well from having sensor driven rate. Um, they look like they could be relatively active. They weren't at the time, but they were not, you know, wheelchair bound or anything like that. So they would definitely benefit from an AIR mode. So that sensor driven mode. Um, but it's something they would want to do in clinical follow-up in, in my case, or with, you know, somebody who directly knows the patient's history and can, can make, you know, judgments there. Okay. Then the, the other thing was about the battery drain. Uh -huh. um, I noticed there was this in the, um, a Medtronic device, actually an, uh, an, a CRT device. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. tried to, I was trying to reassess the, the battery life, the battery parameters, mm -hmm. but that option was not there. So I don't know if uh, maybe Mr. Julius or uh, Mr. Gerard, uh, if you're familiar with that, because I noticed that for that device, I couldn't reassess the, the battery, battery parameters. Current yeah. Drain. yeah, when I said that, AJ, and I, I thought about it, not I think most, um, most of the Medtronic devices have it. Not all of them will show the current drain some of them would display the voltage impedance, battery impedance, and then the current drain. Um, some of them, I think, I don't know the ICDs actually do. They, they show you the charge time. Um, and and yeah, they don't show any show you the voltage. 
um, and obviously the remaining longevity as well. But I think a lot of the pacemakers actually do, though. Um, CRTP, I'm not convinced. Uh, I think they should do. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that, Elvis. So you're, pro you're probably right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I've, I was, I was going to say, AJ, really quickly. So on the AAI devices, Medtronic, um, the ones that I've come across, um, we also do get some St. Jude ones, actually, I've seen. So they were implanted a long time ago, so the old Medtronic ones. Um, I don't know if you've seen them, Jared, but um, they've got this like really ancient algorithm, var Vario test, Vario, and, and basically do Vario. A lot of people see them. People training at the moment see the AI devices um, mm -hmm. and the way it was like 15, <laughs> I don't know, 20 years ago. And they're like, what the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> How did you go ahead and do your test? Like, you know, I remember when I was training in Scotland, I had to get my seniors to come and show me. Um, and that's, he's got this Vario test um, and think when you, you can use that for testing, it does, you can do your threshold sensing and everything, but okay. you, or you can bypass it and actually do it individually as well. But it doesn't have that automatic or, or, or the auto functions that you have in your modern and devices at the moment. Kids are sport these days, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely need your surface ECG on with that one. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, you can definitely see how uh, so helpful a surface is in this case, just to be able to see the conduction there. It's funny you mentioned Vario. There's actually a Vario test on Microny devices, uh, which is like a VVI device, but it's an, it's an older algorithm for St. Jude as well. I wonder if it's similar. But when you run it, it decrement. It's an auto decrement test, but it yeah. decrements super fast. Yeah. So it it'll just run it down to the wire, and then you just have to go back and review it, and it's good because then you don't worry about you know a patient being symptomatic. But it's you feel completely out of control when it does it because you can't actually end the test. It just runs. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. I'll go ahead and switch to a different screen. Maybe. Can you see the other PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Ignore that I just gave you the ending of how to solve this problem. Okay. Has anyone ever heard of anodal stimulation at all? Yes, I, um, yeah. I, I have. Uh, yep. I have. Uh, <laughs> okay. That's good. Uh, so I, the reason why I asked that is because I've, I've talked to clinics before um, and some of them have, and some of them have never heard of this concept at all. And it can be a little scary because if you're programming patients wrong and they have anodal stimulation, you could be doing them a disservice as far as biventricular pacing goes. Uh, so it's, it's less of an issue nowadays um, because we have bipolar ability and we don't have unipolar only Um LV leads, when LV leads first came out, you only had the unipolar tip and then you had to program it um, to the RV typically. So nowadays you have the ability to, to customize your vectors. You have four different electrodes on modern quartet leads. It makes life a lot easier, but it's still a, it's an existing issue. It's just less of an issue. Um, so I wanted to bring it to everyone's attention. And then, like I said, feel free to jump in if you have questions. All right. So anodal stem, basically what happens, uh, ignore the, the, the funnel here, I guess here, it's just a nice little aid, but you have a high current density, um, which causes a increased risk of depolarization at the anode. So imagine this is your cathodal electrode and this is your um, anodal electrode. So there's a big difference in size, having a larger cathode to a smaller anode or even high outputs, what can happen is you have all of this electricity flowing nice smoothly through the cathode, and then it hits this pinch point as it goes to the anode, and you have this buildup of polarization at the side of the anode, which can actually cause um, capture at the anode side as well. Not really as big of a deal in a like a quartet lead, but if, say, this is in the right ventricle, what can happen is you're pacing in the left ventricle, and you're capturing in the right ventricle, which is not exactly ideal. So things to be aware, if you have a smaller anode versus cathode surface area, 
Um, or if you have a very high output, if you throw enough energy at it, you can also have anodal capture as well, just because the energy has to have some place to go. If it can't flow smoothly through that, uh, through the funnel, it's going to start capturing at the, at the location. So to demonstrate anodal stimulation here, here is a very old school 2004 uh, unipolar only device, <clears throat> unipolar, unipolar LV only device. And it does a pretty good job of demonstrating um, anodal stimulation here. So here we have our lead one and Julius, you're a resident um, EKG expert. So if anyone has any questions, he'll be the one answering those. Um, and then down here, we have a V-tip to V-ring vector as well. So we're pacing here at our output of 1.5 volts. Uh, let's go ahead and assume it's at 0.4 or 0.5. Um, we're decrementing down here. So we have an A, um, an atrial vent, an A pace, a V pace, A pace, V pace, and we're decrementing down. They drop to 1.25 volts and you see a morphological change, but you also see that we're still seeming to capture here. Um, let's go and assume this patient is dependent. This could be conduction. If they're not, we'll say this is dependent. You see a morphology change um, on the surface EKG. They continue to decrement down to 0.75 volts. We're capturing, we're capturing, we're capturing, and then we get to 0.5, and there's just apparent non-capture with the ventricular pace right here. So they end the threshold test at 0.5. So what does this indicate? Well, since we're only pacing from the LV, and we're seeing this differential morphology, specifically what looks like a left bundle branch morphology here, left bundle branch block morphology, that indicates we are capturing in the LV here. At here, what's happening is the electrical impulse is flowing through the LV, it's running to the right ventricular lead, and it's capturing at the site of the right ventricular lead, specifically the, R, the RV ring, um, which is up against the myocardium and the RV. We have RV capture all the way across here until we finally lose right ventricular capture here, which means your right ventricular capture threshold from LV pacing is 0.75 volts. Your LV capture threshold, we lose capture here. So our LV capture threshold is 1.5 volts. Does that make sense for everyone? Yeah, yep. that's good. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So what can we do? So you want to avoid pacing to from the LV to the RV ring. Instead, choose a unipolar. So I just pulled this from our from a St. Jude Abbott um, their their vector testing here, and you can see here your LV lead. You have your D1 or distal one electrode, your M2 or mid two, mid three, and this is kind of covered up, but it's P4 as in proximal four electrode. This is going through the CS. And then it's kind of either lateral or a little posterior, um, kind of high. But anyway, it's of your LV lead placement. Here's your right ventricular lead buried here in the RV. And the pacing vector here is going to the ring. Now, this can be really problematic because when you pace to the ring, you can have that anodal stem here, right? So you could be thinking you're capturing in the LV. And in reality, you're actually capturing in the RV with no LV capture at all. So um, you can have simultaneous LVRV capture as well, which is probably what is occurring here. I would say, well, that is what is occurring here is simultaneous LVRV capture, um, or you can have non-capture completely. So pacing, uh, just avoid going to the RV ring. I would always recommend this. I have patients that will come in sometimes to clinic and you'll see them pacing to the ring. Um, if you have a uh, defibrillator, send it to the coil because a coil is a nice big surface area. So you don't have to worry about that, that funneling or that, that anodal stem because the surface area of a coil is much longer than, or much larger than the surface area of your, um, your cathode electrode. Um, and then if you have a pacemaker, I would just go to the can. I would avoid RV ring unless you don't care about simultaneous pacing. Um, another consideration is that you could very well determine that, oh, you know, we're getting some anodal stem, but who cares? It's simultaneously pacing. But then somebody in the clinic could come in, run a threshold test and say, oh, my capture threshold, without you looking at the uh, EKG symbol, my capture threshold is 0.75, when in reality, it's 1.5. Looking at it here, this looks pretty similar. If you're just looking at the EGMs on the device, 
you're not really going to see a big difference between this one and this one versus this profound difference between here and here. And I've seen that issue in the clinic where a clinic has said, oh, my threshold is here. We set our output at 1.25 volts and congratulations, we are pacing this patient all day long in the right ventricle, thinking that we're pacing them in the left ventricle. We're essentially um, you know, increasing their risk for heart failure, especially in patients that don't even need pacing um, just as a result of of having endodal stimulation. So, sorry, uh, big, yes, sir. So, sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, I was you're just going to say, I think if you go back to that ECG again, just in case somebody, when you mention left bundle branch from the RV anodal pacing, but like you get mm-hmm. a left bundle branch. So, the reason why you get your what looks a, a little bit like an RSR in lead one, um, mm-hmm. this is what you would typically get with a left bundle branch. Um, somebody might be thinking, well, left bundle branch, do I see that like right bundle branch morphology in V1, like RSR? But this is what you normally get typically for left bundle in lead one. And you get your deep S wave in V1, but we're not, obviously we haven't got an S wave, uh, the V1 here, so we can't see that. But this is, yeah, AJ spot on. Like this is what you see in lead one, like a right bundle branch morphology. But this is a left bundle branch because we're seeing that in lead one. Is that, I hope I've been confused it more, sorry. No, no I, I think that's exactly right. And, you know, that's why I appreciate to have you as our as our guide, our EKG guru. So I have another example here later on, um, and I'd love your input on it. So okay. we'll kind of move along here. Uh, let's see. But no, that's that's fantastic. Um, feel free to jump in anytime. Pacing our result results sometimes. Um, sorry. I, as a substitute, I've only read through these slides once before we presented. So um, just make sure that, you know, you have sufficient energy. Um, you know, it, in these cases too, you you run the risk of having anodal stimulation at within a lead too. So if you set a bipolar vector on a quadrupolar lead, say we're pacing from um, D1 to M2 um, as an option, M2 is generally a larger um, electrode, or it is a larger electrode than D1. So the chance of anodal stem is low, but if you increase that output enough, you could very well be capturing at the M2 site as well at the anode. Now, if you think about it, you know, that's only about 10 millimeters of length distance between them. So you're probably, you know, either these wave fronts are kind of crashing into each other and it doesn't affect anything, or you could have functional non-capture as one has a delay. So, uh, it's really not a big issue as much though you could think you're pacing on the site of latest activation, uh, when in reality you're, you're capturing at a site of much earlier activation, um, which is kind of a more advanced concept with bi pacing. But just keep that in mind is that um, there's always the opportunity to, to have anodal stem no matter what vector you're pacing from, unless you're going to an RV coil just because they're so big that it's never going to be an issue uh, with surface area. But if you ever have similar electrode uh, size, there's always an opportunity for that. And then output obviously matters as well. All right. So this patient comes in 3262 um, pacemaker, biventricular pacemaker. They had a pocket revision. Uh, they were device flipping. They were they were a twiddler, so they flipped the device. It didn't just flip on its own. Um, at the time of the revision, we saw that uh, LV tip to ring pacing uh, was had a parent anodal stem. So in clinic, we went ahead and optimized them to make sure that uh, this would stop occurring. And then we went in and took some screenshots as well. So um, LVRV anodal capture threshold was 0.5 volts at 0.5 milliseconds. So we'll go ahead and show this here. So uh, Julius, feel free to talk through this, yeah. but we got this yeah. nice little diagram here. Oh, what are you saying? I, oh, right. <laughs> Right, so um, you mean the hexacell reference system? Go over that. Yeah. Or... Oh no, whatever. I just I just put you on the spot. My bad, man. <laughs> no. So one we're thing I like your your on. input in here is we're we're RV only pacing. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk us through the deflection on on lead uh, three here. What we're seeing? Right, okay. Well, they're all negative. They all should be negative there. Um, in, in this one here, I'm um, sorry, in, in, in the top lead here, seven, mm-hmm. okay, um, they are showing negative there, but obviously that one's smaller. That there is there is a change in in, in the morphology um, sort of size, um, mm-hmm. as you see there. So they are showing negative. That one, there, um, I think the fifth one is it? Okay, mm-hmm. the fifth one is showing 
uh, slight, I don't know, I wouldn't even call it biphasic. Um, mm-hmm. It's still negative, but it has been considerably smaller. And mm-hmm. then, then you go, then, yeah, go on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the one thing to note, too, obviously, um, <laughs> this is a noisy lead. So some of these differences that he's pointing out um, could very well be difference in polariza- depolarization. It could also just be that the noise is kind of affecting our interpretation of it. Um, so yeah, to his point, we have, we're using lead three and I, Julius knows this by heart. I have to, I like to look at these when I'm looking at EKG lead, just because I, I look at EGMs all day. I, I wish I knew uh, EKGs better, but if we're looking at our depolarization, it's, it's a negative deflection. So we're, we're flowing away from lead three, correct? Yep. That's right. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I'm glad you're there to confirm. <laughs> so lead three here, we're showing the flow of electrons moving away from lead three, which means that the activation pattern is moving from the right ventricle um, and moving away from the RV towards the LV, which indicates, which makes sense. We're RV only pacing. And then, you know, here's my wheelhouse. If you look at the EGMs here, we're V pacing. You see on your RV bipolar um, channel right here, channel three, you have RV activation here followed by a delayed LV activation. So if you look at your LV bipolar, which is your one to two, if we looked at this here, we're observing one to two here, and we're observing bipolar here. So this is your LV, this is your RV, vectors within the heart. Once again, LV is here, RV is here. We're seeing activation on the RV channel first, followed by activation on the LV channel, which indicates that the event is occurring next to the right ventricle first. Makes sense. All right, so then we go to the current programming. And if you look at it morphologically, you still have a negative deflection. Obviously it's a much cleaner EGM. Uh, We got the patient to sit still for half a second. It's a little more narrow, which indicates one, it could just be because this was a noisy EGM here, but it also is probably some degree of fusion is occurring. So slight morphology change, uh, narrow but similar deflection, Near so what we're what we're concluding is we're having near simultaneous LVRV activation. This could be LV artifacts um, with RV capture, but looking at our channels here, once again we have our RV pace uh, or our LV pace. We know we're pacing LV because it says VP, so we're only pacing in one channel. It would say BP if it was in both channels. And this little tail is pointing to the left, which means it's pacing in the left. However, if you look at your RV channel the activation is occurring the exact same time as the LV channel, which combining that with EKG indicates that we have uh, simultaneous LV RV capture, which is not the worst thing to have in the world. But if your RV threshold is lower than your, your RV anodal capture threshold is lower than your LV capture threshold, what could happen in the clinic and what happens way too often is the threshold is marked for RV capture, the output is below the LV capture threshold, and we're actually by RV pacing this patient. So we are pacing in the RV, uh, or sorry, on the LV channel first, and then whatever offset we have later, we're going to pace um, in the RV itself. So we're going to have a pace in the LV, it does not capture, it anodal stimulates the RV and then we pace the RV and it either functionally non-captures or it contributes to this wave front moving this direction, which can obviously contribute to heart failure, um, which is not ideal. So um, what do we do here? So we then, um, we went to LV only pacing, but this time we changed the vector from a by or from the uh, M3 to RV ring to an M3 to CAN vector, which means that we're pacing from the left, we'll bring this back up. We're pacing from the left ventricular uh, vector here at M3, and instead going up to the CAN, completely taking the RV ring out of the equation. Let me bring it back up here. Okay. Morphologically, you see a massive change in the morphology. You see we're still pacing LV first because this little tail is pointing to the left you see that there is activation on the left ventricular channel followed by activation on the RV channel. This means that we are actually pacing on the left ventricle. And then I don't know if you have any insight, um, Julius, on on this morphology. You could probably 
give a little more information on that if you have anything on vector on lead three. If not, no worries. Okay, so um, yeah, so we have the left ventricular capture here, um, delayed re reaction to the RV, which means we have good conduction. And oh, sorry, I'm, I'm mute. I was muted. Oh, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I was going to say, ideally, I'd probably use um, V1 and lead one, um, mm -hmm. possibly obviously lead three as well, because that, that really shows when you get your uh, you get your left bundle branch like RV pacing with our nodal, it will, you know, uh, because that access <clears throat> shifts to that, like you demonstrated in, in the previous one. Um, and then if one, if you get like your biventricular pacing or LV pacing only, then you get your shift to the um, a stream, a stream axis or right, right quadrant axis, you know, um, pacing or, or even, um, right axis deviation one, um, lead one, lead one, um, lead one. I mean, lead three is good as well, but it's always good to, I always look at like several leads, particularly V1 and also lead one. And if I can get lead three as well, that, that would be quite good. Um, lead, lead one helps with indication of access a lot. It's, it's a good one to look at. Um, mm. Because I tend to find lead three um, is is an is an odd lead um, that behaves really odd, um, just the same as your AVL lead. They're always odd leads, so sometimes they can be slightly misleading. Um, general as a general rule for ECG interpretation, um, but yeah, that yeah, you have to spot on, AJ. So th this this shows like almost like a Q wave in in lead lead three, um, and then you can see like. Um, there's a narrow there's a narrow axis i'm not convinced that's the t wave there so i think the act sorry there's a the, yeah the, the actual um, duration is narrower and i mm -hmm. think that's the t wave at the end of that so um so yeah um it is it is considerably narrower and it's a biphasic lead so that that's showing that the axis has completely shifted probably to if it's biphasic can, um aj can you point can you show the hexaaxial referencing system <clears throat> yeah, let me pull this up. So yeah, so as, if you imagine like the vector, if 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 it, um, like a uh, like a boat with a sail, and if the wind is moving towards, uh, moving blowing into the sail, then um, then the vector will be moving towards it. If it's if it's blowing away from it, then the vector will be like opposite. It, if if you know what I mean. If there's so the wind blowing in the opposite direction, then it will blow in that direction that's a general rule for vectors and, and axis so <clears throat> if you see the biphasic lead three like like the one we're looking at, at the moment shows a completely negative uh, negative um lead three so that shows that it's moving away from lead three so that's the opposite so that's going into the left left axis deviation and that's typical of left bundle branch block um and that's what you would see but if you're showing biphasic that means it's not quite pointing either away from it perpendicular um or towards it so it's kind of almost at um pointing halfway from it so that's why you see the biphasic so that, that if you go back actually <laughs> sorry AJ. <laughs> sorry i'm prolonging prolonging this no go for it this is great i was gonna try to copy this all across i'm just gonna do this quick and dirty here let's see how's that yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, it's a lot smaller though than it was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there we if, go. Yeah, excellent. So um so biphasic. So what that's telling you that is either um going towards like the AVR that you can see or or going away from it, like to like lead two almost that or, or lead two. So because mm -hmm. we don't have that um all the limb leads in their entirety, it's quite difficult to work out exactly what angle and what it is. But because it's obviously pacing uh, by then, LV, so we're assuming that is obviously going in the right quadrant um, in that direction. So it's doing the right thing. So I would say it's probably going towards the AVR sort of direction. I'm right. Okay. Yeah, I wish we had. And that's that's a good point about, you know, why we should try to hook up a 12 lead when we're optimizing patients. This is just hooked up to the to the device itself. And you have a pretty limited amount of options of uh, of vectors to use.
but that's a good reason to always have a 12 lead in your clinics if possible for any kind of you know, by the um, optimization. But yeah, to your point, right? You're going kind of biphasic, but also you're going fairly positive as well compared to completely negative, which means that it's kind of moving in some degree towards lead three, right? Um, which means it's probably originating higher and moving that direction versus obviously going directly away from it as we were seeing with the other event, meaning we're coming from a completely different um, part of the heart. Um, the activation period. And this is obviously LV only pacing. So you're still going to have some degree of widening just because you're only pacing from the left ventricle. You're not pacing in the natural conduction pathway and it has to make its way across the entire heart. So you're going to have a degree of widening as well. Cool. Do you have any other points on that, Julius? Um, <clears throat> yeah. So I, I was actually, sorry, sorry, dude. I was actually, no, go for it. If it was completely positive, then you would be mm -hmm. going towards lead three. Mm -hmm. um, it was negative entirely, then you'd be going away from it. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking the fact that it's biphasic and it's a bivent system. So I'm thinking that, and obviously it's narrow and everything. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking we probably got it moving towards AVI in that direction. That's yeah, yeah. It's showing perpendicular. Uh, sorry, kind of perpendicular. By, yeah. by, by phasicness as opposed to uh, perpendicular, if you like. Yeah. Um, yeah. And to your point, that's probably where three is, right? It's right around here. Yeah. So that would make, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. What would you think, Jared? Like... Yeah, no, I agree. And I'm just trying to work out, especially you've got to be careful too with uh, when you're programming something to can unipolar that you do get a bit of artifact, unipolar artifact on the ECG as well. So um, that can always so appear. Um, mm. But for what it's worth, the first thing I, I personally like to do when I get a CRT and if it even if it is programmed, um, if it is programmed anything other than bipolar, so like an RV, an LV to RV or LV to CAN is I like to program it to true bipolar. That is some kind of LV bipolar, even if it's high 10 volts, eight volts, whatever the capture may be, just so I can really see what true by LV capture looks like. All I want, mm. I just want a couple of beats in my mind just to go, right, that's what the ECG is looking at in true LV capture. And then I can go back and then do my thresholds in the current vector that it's programmed in. Does that make sense? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. no, absolutely. Yeah. Because Fantastic. it just helps then differentiate between, um, you know, it just again, in my mind, I go, right, that's true LV capture. This is what I think is by V capture using a, uh, an anode other than the um, LV. And then I can look for then, if I lose that, then I can look for a different morphology. So it just gives me a breakdown of all different morphologies. Yeah. Spot on, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for the input. Um, and yeah, Julius, anytime you want to chime in on EKG stuff, you know, I'm not, that's not my specialty. So, <laughs> um, so here, by the way, I don't know if you saw here, but the atrial channel, I mean, this is some sort of atrial flutter. I mean, you can maybe say it's, I don't know, I never want to judge off an, off an EGM, but judging from the cycle length. Um, and then you can see the device is appropriately sensing it. It's in mode switch. And it's just these ones that don't have little tick marks indicate that they've fallen into an absolute blanking period. Uh, just to kind of update here, AMS means it's in mode switch. So that's just what's going on in the device in the back end. Uh, the final programming, they opted to do uh, LV um, by 80 milliseconds. That's why it looks very similar to our LV only pacing. It's a, maybe a little more narrow here, but the reason being uh, that it looks very similar is just because you're getting a lot of LV activation, not a ton of RV activation. Uh, whether or not physicians you know, feel really comfortable with having a narrow QRS with less ac LV activation versus more LV activation, um, that's, that's kind of up to their clinical discretion there. But a lot of the dynamic algorithms like sync av or i believe is adapt day and medtronic are aimed at trying to get as much you know intrinsic conduction which in this case we wouldn't have much of because uh, the atrium is in flutter um and also lv rv pacing to make the most narrow qrs possible um, so we could maybe say we could optimize this to have a shorter um, lv first um, offset but that really just depends on the physician themselves and what they what they uh, want to see, but we do see we're by V pacing and we're going LV first because your little um, tick mark is pointing towards the left. So it's pacing in the left first, waiting 80 milliseconds, which isn't really visible, but you can see um, in the programming. And then it's pro it's pacing the RV, 
We know that we're capturing in the LV because we have the LV um, event here. The morphology looks very similar to LV pacing. You have LV activation first, followed by RV activation. Make sense for everybody? It's nice. Yep. <clears throat> Perfect. So just to review, anodal stem. Um, we have that funneling effect that occurs uh, where you can end up having you know, a high current capturing at the anode. And the ways to avoid that is avoid pacing from a larger, um, sorry, I wrote this like very quickly. Um, this is backwards. It should say avoid pacing from a larger cathode to a smaller anode. So just ignore that text there. Um, avoid excessive outputs for chronic leads. Um, same thing. I mean, for acute leads, you you do have higher outputs just because we want to make sure we're capturing um, as a state lead is less stable. It could move. We want to have a higher output at chronic settings for the battery. You want to have a smaller output. And then also you'll are less likely to have anodal stimulation with a smaller output or for a wider pulse width. Um, amplitude is really your uh, your big issue here. So higher voltage can lead to uh, to greater chance of anodal stimulation. Once again, larger cathode to smaller anode. Um, always have a surface EKG. I'm going to continue to say that even though I don't always follow my own practice, but without a surface EKG, it's a lot harder to see what's going on. Um, so when in doubt, put on a surface. Um, you know, if you're ever having a question, you always want to have that stuff on hand just so you can take a look and see um, what the can, what the device can't even necessarily see. Um, and then program it appropriately. Once again, these devices are not, you know, that intelligent. They do what they do based upon what they see. Um, and they're very strict with that. So it's our job to kind of optimize what input it is to get the correct output. All right. Um, and then when you don't have a surface, look at your RV uh, activation on the R or look at your activation timing on your LV and RV bipolar. Um, so it, one way you can kind of prove that is by setting your LV first um, in dependent patients by 80 milliseconds, that's a good way to tell without, you know, worrying about loss of capture in the ventricle, um, or you can just do LV only pacing to confirm. All right. Any questions? Uh, last, I will send this out to everyone once I make a few corrections, but, uh, here's some links on anodal stimulation, both pretty good articles they are about a decade old, but you know, this is not new. Um, and there's lots of information to be garnered from that. So. Anybody got anything for me? That was good, mate. There's nothing in the chat group, so I assume everyone's happy otherwise. Or asleep, one of the two. But I appreciate you all being here. All right. <laughs> Perfect. I will move on to the last. So I know it's already going to be more than an hour, so let's just burn through this as quick as possible. Let me switch screens. Here, maybe, okay, and I'm going to quickly scroll up. All right, really quick. Um, so what's happening in the CGM? Do you want to take a look at it? I just showed you, but anyone want to take a shot? Maybe one for Elvis. Something in the chat. I think he's he running out, run out of battery. Out of battery. <laughs> okay. So he said one um, prolongation. Yep. Um, so he, you're absolutely right. You do see a uh, successive or a, a prolongation of the AV, but why? Um, this is Pacemaker Wikibach. So what happens is when you hit the max track rate, and I'll go ahead and scroll down um, <clears throat> here so you can actually see what the um, – what was written about it, but your max track rate mediates how fast the device is allowed to pace. The reason why a max track rate exists is one, so we don't pace the patient at, you know, 180 beats a minute when we don't need to, but also because typically we'll run into a uh, pacemaker uh, two to one block rate, uh, which is your total atrial refractory period, uh, was well, mediated by your total atrial refractory period, the total time that the atrium is blanking. So if your two to one block rate, your total atrial refractory is too long, ventricular atrial events will occur, the device will not sense them, and it will completely withhold a pace because there's nothing to, to track. The next atrial event will come by, it'll by pace, 
it'll miss this atrial event and then it'll buy B pace. So you'll see a patient go say if they're two to one block rate, and we can go on this on a deeper, on a deeper dive, a different day. But if your two to one block rate is 120 beats a minute, um, and you hit it all of a sudden you'll go from 119 beats a minute pacing to 60 beats a minute pacing, because you're now missing every other atrial event as it falls into refractory and the device is not tracking it. Uh, not ideal. Um, a way to kind of slow a patient down. And then also if you have a low, a high two to one block rate, avoid pacing them too fast is to set your max track rate or the fastest the device will pace the patient. So in this case, uh, as you hit your max track, the device withholds its by V pace. So instead of pacing it at the 102 milliseconds, it waits a little bit longer, 164 milliseconds. And this atrial event comes across and it waits a little bit longer and then it paces at 227 milliseconds. And then this atrial event comes across. And if you see here, it falls into the device's relative refractory period, which means the device does not track it. So no pace occurs. The next, an atrial alert window opens up the next atrial event occurs, which falls into the, uh, the device tracks it. And we see this immediate by V pace at hundred milliseconds. Once again, another one occurs, but it's too quick. So the device waits a little bit longer because it's at the max track rate. It then paces and so on and so forth. So you have this winky bock like, um, or it is winky bock, but it's pacemaker winky bock. So very similar to what you see with the AV node. This is just the device replicating what the natural AV node does. Um, and I'll go ahead and, you know, feel free to pause this on the YouTube channel and you'll be able to uh, read through this piece by piece, but that's the answer. Any questions on that? Nope. All right. Um, anyone yeah. want to take a shot at that? I see Elvis already answered it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. For even confidence, therefore... Uh, yeah, so this is exactly right what Elvis said. Basically, what he's saying is that there's poor rate variability. So you're looking at this heart rate histogram here, and you see it's fairly monolithic. So remember, histograms is not the patient's heart rate within like a, um, it, it's it's not like a, a walk test, right? What you're looking at is their total percent of times that their heart rate is at a certain rate. So every time they're at 60 beats a minute, it counts towards this. Every time they're at 90 beats a minute, it counts towards this. We see they spend the majority of their time, probably you know 95% of their time at 60 beats a minute, between 60 and 70 beats a minute or the base rate. Um, this is not ideal if a patient is chronotropically incompetent, especially if they're an active patient. So in this case, you would want to make some sort of change by either turning on the sensor or making the sensor more aggressive. In this case, the sensor is on, I would say, just based upon the answer of this question down below, but it's probably just not sensitive enough. So recommended first change, tur turn down the threshold or... Um, <clears throat> Sorry, turn down the, yeah, it reduced the threshold of what it takes to indicate actual movement. So in Abbott devices, I'm not sure about Medtronic devices, we have what's called threshold and slope. So your threshold is its ability for the uh, device to detect movement at all. So if a patient is very, very, um, very, very active, you may want to have a higher threshold for what it determines to be activity or the sensor will be going off all the time. If a patient is not as active, is not say in a, in a wheelchair, but still wants to vary their heart rate, you may want to reduce the threshold to make the device more sensitive towards any kind of movement they may have. Um, so threshold is your way of kind of modulating how sensitive the device is to movement. Uh, these use a piezoelectric sensor hooked up to a circuit board that basically it just detects movement back and forth. Um, and by reducing threshold, you're making the device more sensitive. Uh, if you, for example, the device is appropriately sensing, but it's just not increasing their heart rate enough. So you do see that on the EGMs, the sensor indicated rate is going off but the patient's heart rate is not uh, increasing to appropriate levels, that's when you can increase the slope. Slope is how fast the heart rate is paced based on a given threshold value. So if the threshold is appropriately programmed, that's when you can increase the slope, which means when it detects movement, it increases the heart rate more appropriately. In this case, the first change I would make for this patient would be to um, 
reduce the threshold and then do a 10 minute walk test or less even. You can just have them get up and walk a couple lot, laps around the room. And if you see that the sensor um, is going off, that indicates that the threshold is probably programmed appropriately um, and we maybe need to increase the slope. If we see that they're walking around and the sensor is not responding at all, that means that we probably need to make the device more sensitive as far as threshold goes, lowering the threshold value so that it detects their movement. Inversely, if the patient is sitting and the threshold is just going off while they're doing nothing, um, if the sensor is going off while they're doing nothing, that means the threshold is probably too low. It's too sensitive to your, towards any of their movement. We don't need to modulate their rate when they're sitting around doing nothing. It's when they're under activity. So this is when those walk tests are really important. Feel free to call one of us uh, if you have a patient in clinic and we can kind of talk you through how to do these tests. But there's just some ways you can play around in general, though. If you have a patient that doesn't move much and you want the device to respond, lower the threshold. If you have a patient that the threshold is programmed appropriately, but it's just not getting their heart rate up fast enough, increase the slope. It's always better to make gradual changes. You know, you don't want to change too many things overnight and then send them out into the real world um, because you could be pacing their heart rate at 120 beats a minute all the time for no reason. So make sure to do your walk tests, make sure to evaluate uh, before you just kick them out the door. <clears throat> Questions on that at all? I was just, I was just going to add AJ that, um, yeah, other, other manufacturers like Boston and, and I know Soren have got what you, you know, what you call blended sensors um, mm -hmm. and blends mini ventilation with accelerometer like activity sensors like you described there. Um, so that that sort of increases its sensitivity, having um, other, other parameters as well, um, other sensors in addition. And mm -hmm. the ventilation obviously works on how, if the patient um, breathes rapidly, then the impedance, um, the, the impedance basically changes very rapidly. And it basically calibrates that with um, how how quickly or how high it increase how how quickly it responds to changes in 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 level of activity, i.e., breathing rates. So the more you breathe, the more rapidly you breathe, the more the um, impedance changes rate. There's more there's more changes in the impedance. So that correlates with um, that. Oh, this person is working really hard. They're breathing really hard. Well, I need to increase their heart rate much higher. And that so um, blender sensors, mini ventilation, activity sensors, accelerometers all combined to give you better effect, uh, better yeah. um, sensor than, yeah. I believe those are called closed loop as well. Is so, that yeah. correct? So Biotronic, closed um, CLS, closed loop stimulation closed loop. as well. Yeah, works. It's actually slightly better than 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 your traditional ones, closed loop, mm. which actually um, goes by contractility. It works on that contractility as well of your myocardium. Um, mm. So it's much more sensitive than than any of the other ones, I, I think, in my opinion. What do you think, Jared? Yeah, I totally agree. I've heard big raps about the Biotronic one. We don't um, we don't implant a lot of Biotronic, so my knowledge isn't great, I must admit. But I have heard good raps about that. Yeah, it's really good for um, visual vagal syncope patients. Like yeah. Yeah, that's is fantastic. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, there are a lot of different sensors out there. And just remember that everything we're trying to do is mimic the own human heart. Like the, the natural human heart is, is hard to beat. So we're just trying to get as, as close as we can as possible. All right, last question here. So we have a pace AV delay of 250 milliseconds. Um, so... Um, What's happening after the AMS? What does the ALOC mean? And then why did the dev device have a VPP? Anyone want to take a stab at what that means? Normally I'd pick on Elvis, but I think he had to run or his battery <laughs> might have died. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I assume the ALOC is atrial loss of capture. Um, I could be, I'm just trying to look at what markers I'm looking at. One, two, three is the V sense. Yeah. So, so pretty... oh, yeah, sorry, go on. No, no, no. So I was just questioning whether there's, yeah, I, I, I was, I was guessing that maybe A is A like loss of capture and the VPPs uh, based on I think what we just spoke about before with the RV auto capture. So you've got a loss of capture on the RV, so it's sending out a a backup pulse. Yeah. So um, 
you're you're you got the second part, and this is really confusing, and that's the reason why they they added this question here. A loss of capture in this case, um, our device doesn't our Abbott's devices don't just say L, um, it won't say a loss of capture or v loss of capture. It just says LOC, and you kind of have to figure out which one loss capture. And here here's the issue: is basically our sweep speed has compressed our marker channel. So we have sir, the sensor driven rate is running. We have AMS. And this was an AMS event that got overwritten by a loss of capture trigger as well. So if you actually take this eGEM, change the sweep speed to it, you'll actually see AMS, LOC. And then when you change the sweep speed, you'll actually see VP, VP here. So you're absolutely right. This is auto capture algorithm being confused and saying, I don't know if I captured or not. So here's a backup pace of five volts just in case. This is it telling you that auto capture was confused. And you can see it's kind of like overwritten the A there. It's less clear in this one, but that's just it literally overriding the AMS with LOC. You could also maybe see SI LOC as well as it overwrites SIR. It's confusing. And we get some questions about that. So just to confirm, that's what's going on here. Um, and then, yeah, you're absolutely correct. So um, interesting, we talked about this last week, r and VAS, that's what we're seeing here, right? We're seeing a uh, ventricular pace, an atrial retrograde, or possibly a true atrial event, who's to say, um, but nothing's occurring. It doesn't conduct, so I'd say it's probably a, an atrial retrograde because um, they do appear to have intact conduction. We atrial pace, but it's pacing into refractory, which means we're not actually capturing um, at all. We ventricular pace and we kind of have this VA conduction retrograde um, V pacing loop that's occurring. Uh, remember when we talk about R and R VAS, ways to solve this is you change your um, your delays and you can also change your base rate and or change your sensor. It's just an idiosyncrasy of everything kind of lining up to be a, a mess here. Um, what's occurring here is we have enough atrial events. We have an atrial tick. We have an atrial pace. Atrial atrial event. Atrial pace. These all count towards mode switch. The device mode switches, so it's now in a ventricular-based timing mode. Um, here we have an atrial place, doesn't capture. You see here we actually probably have a, um, we have an atrial, sorry, um, sorry, we have an atrial pace we probably did capture. Morphologically, it looks different here when we V-pace. That's because we're either fusing with the intrinsic ventricular event um, or we're not actually contributing at all. Um, same thing again, we atrial pace, it probably does capture, it makes its way to the ventricle. The device happens to V-pace at the exact same time because it just lines up with the uh, the paced AV delay, um, which causes the device to become confused, saying, did I actually capture? Because morphologically, it looks different from a ventricular pace morphology on its own near-field channels. Um, you can see here, Morphologically, here is an A-sense, V-sense without our ventricular pacing interference, and it looks very similar. The conducted atrial event or conducted ventricular event from the atrium looks very similar. So I'd say there's probably some degree of fusion here. Um, here's your intrinsic. Does that make sense where we're at? And I'll scroll down so everyone can read the answer. So the... The A in the ALOC doesn't necessarily mean atrium. It just means there's A loss of capture. Is that correct? The A, the A actually doesn't mean anything at all. Yeah, um, okay. So, well, it does. It means AMS. Um, here, I'll scroll back. So this LOC is the only thing that matters. That means loss of capture. It just happens to be overlapping with this AMS marker Sorry, channel. You did so say that. Yes. Yeah, no, okay. you're good. You're yeah. good, man. No, these are, like I said, when, when you don't look at these devices much, you, the, it can be really confusing to see what's going on. It would make more sense if they would like stagger them a little bit or change the color coding, but it doesn't. Um, so in this case, you have AMS and LOC. And if you change the sweep speed, you would see that clearly. It's just, unfortunately, it's getting overridden. Um, so yeah. Cool. Uh, really nice. Yeah. And then here's the rest of the question if you wanted to pause and review later. But yeah, that is it. Any other questions for me at all? No, it's really good, mate. Good talk. Thank you. Really good yeah. talk. Thanks. Thanks, AJ. Thank you. Happy Thank to you. do it. Very good. It's really All good. right. Well, if there's any questions in the meantime, uh, feel free to email or message us. We're happy to answer whatever you might have. Um, and then we'll have a, a proper speaker, hopefully next week, to uh, to actually talk about some real content. 
No, we, AJ, we've got a real deal here. Come on, we've uh, got a real deal here. <laughs> yeah, you talk yourself out. Come on. <laughs> but that, that's All right. Well, I said an honorary speaker. That's why I said honorary. Honorary. Exactly. Yeah, I I appreciate the shout out. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, thank you, uh, Julius, Jared, Elvis, and everybody for for being on this call. You know, it's it's uh, it's great to sit down on a on a Sunday and talk it over with you. And anything we can do to help, just let us know. Thanks, man. Appreciate your time. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Thank you.